Maggie Sara, and this is a 3D printed granular jamming hand, my entry into the I am 3D challenge. Uh, so the first thing that we need to talk about are state-of-the-art prostheses. Uh, there are two types of hand and arm prostheses. Um, there are the passive body control types and then the active myoelectric. Now the passive kind uh, has poor dexterity, it's just a hook and cable, so you have open and close. And then it also has a poor aesthetic, it's ugly. Um, and actually a lot of people stop wearing them because they find them alienating, they attract negative attention. The uh, active myoelectric prostheses are actually very heavy, which is a problem because it can cause curvature of the spine. You'll lean away from something that's heavy. And they're also very expensive. They start at $11,000. Uh, both types are injection molded, or at least most parts of them are injection molded. Uh, that means there's minimal customization. Uh, if you want to make a hand to fit a certain person, you have to modify the entire mold and start from scratch. Uh, they're also not readily accessible. There's an estimated 10 million amputees worldwide, and only half ever get access to prosthetics as it is currently. So the project objective is to make a prosthetic hand that's readily available to anyone, anywhere. And what this means is we need to start with a brand new distribution model. We need a distribution model that's able to be manufactured by anyone with minimal training. And it needs to be able to be mobilized to the source of the need, and it needs to be less expensive than traditional methods, because otherwise we're not going to be helping anyone. So the solution to this is 3D printing. So the distribution model would be one person, who I'm calling person A, is trained in how to use the printer, how to measure people for prosthetics, how to modify the models. They then travel with the printer in some supplies. So they'll bring filament, motors, things like that. Then when they get there, they can obtain common supplies, because there are also rubber bands, coffee grounds, things that are chosen because they're so common and easy to find. They locate a space to operate and a volunteer. Then person A can measure users and print parts. They can devote all of their time to just doing that kind of work. And then person B can assemble the prostheses. You don't need a lot of training to assemble these. They're printed, the form is printed in um, eight parts. Uh, there's just not that many parts to worry about. So it doesn't take much training at all to learn how to assemble one. After the need is met, person A moves on, person B uh, moves on as well, I guess. And um, person A can then travel to the next place and the next place. And that way you're not traveling uh, with multiple people, you're not spending a lot of money on travel or shipping, uh, which gives you more money to spend on actually making prosthetics and actually giving them to people. And this is really cool because it eliminates the need for centralized manufacturing. Uh, in the past, you would have measured somebody and then shopped it out to a company which would then make it and then send it back. And this company would need uh, multiple kinds of machine tools. They would need personnel trained to use them. They would need electricity. You don't need any of that with this system. You need a $2,000 3D printer that you just carry with you and you need ele enough electricity to run that in a computer. So the design objective, because you've got to start somewhere, is to create a below the elbow prosthetic hand. And that's because that's one of the most common forms of amputation. The hand needs to be open source so that anybody anywhere can get it. It needs to be made in open source software so that anybody can edit it. It needs to be highly affordable, ideally under $500, so that we can actually give it to people. If it's comparable in price, the $11,000 prosthesis, we're not gonna help many people. It needs to be high functioning. We don't want it to just be decorative, it needs to actually be functional. And it's task oriented. It's not meant for heavy lifting, it's meant just to give you your quality of life back. You know, so you can eat on your own, drink on your own, open doors, uh, and not have to struggle. It needs to be simple to produce so that uh, we can travel and do things quickly. We don't need all those people. And fully customizable. So the first thing that we did was look at anthropometry. We want to match the size of an average hand. Uh, we found average finger lengths, average hand and forearm weight, and finger length ratios just to make it look like a real hand. But it also needs to act like a real hand. So we looked at human hand functionality. Now, in human hands, there are long forearm muscles pulling on the tendons in your fingers, and there's short muscles in your hand allowing for adduction and abduction, which is the spreading of your fingers and pushing them back together. There's also the femur eminence, which allows your thumb to meet your fingers. So we then did some preliminary testing. 
we did uh, testing with different types of shapes, different types of doors, different types of cups. We coated them in chalk and then saw how they coated the hand to see which parts of the hand are most commonly used when grasping. We found that mainly we use our thumb index and middle fingers. We don't use our ring and pinky fingers that much, and that is actually reflected in the design, as you'll see. The palm was used often to maintain contact. You use your palm to stabilize whatever you're holding. We also included granular jamming. Now, we included it because of the palm stabilization. We needed something compliant on the palm to help stabilize grip, and the granular jamming is a perfect option for that. It's also perfect because the hand is a little bit clunky, but you can manipulate smaller, awkwardly shaped objects by just picking them up with the palm if it's able to pick things up. Now, the process of granular jamming is uh, if you have uh, an uh, a granule uh, object like coffee grounds inside a soft container like a balloon, at atmosphere or slightly above atmosphere, the coffee grounds act as a fluid. But when you suck the air out to below atmosphere, they jam together and act as a solid. So we performed testing with the balloon, coffee grounds, and a household vacuum, and we found that uh, it works, but granular jamming requires a large amount of surface contact, which is why it's on the palm and not on every finger. We also found that coffee grounds are much more effective than any other material, and that makes sense because that's what the literature seems to agree with, and it's actually interesting why. Uh, they argue that it's because of the varied size, surface textures, and the oil secreted by the coffee grounds actually helps them slide past each other in a fluid state. Uh, and then we also found that depth is even more important than width. If it, it needs to wrap around things well. So from there, more device, uh, device design. We want to match the size and weight of the human hand as closely as possible. And we also want to include the granular jamming pad on the palm. We mount the thumb in opposition to the middle finger. That's because if we included the inner eminence, if we had this ability while also having the thumb pointing outward, uh, we would need a second motor. Uh, and it's just unnecessary. Instead, you sacrifice a little bit of usability by mounting the thumb in opposition so that they always meet. Uh, and that allows you to continue doing small holds, picking up small objects. Uh, you control the first three digits with one motor each and the last two digits with a shared motor. And that's because we found that the uh, ring and pinky finger really aren't used that much. And they're also connected in the human hand. You can't really move one without the other. Uh, it's actuated by cables uh, which are driven by servos in the forearm. This models the way that the human arm works because you have your tendons being pulled in by your muscles. Uh, you control finger position and sense contact with potentiometers. <clears throat> the potentiometers, as they slide, relate the position of the finger, and when they stop moving, you know you've made contact. Uh, you can also add a spring with a known K value, and through that, find the forces involved with the fingers, which is really interesting. It's designed for 3D printing, and what I mean by that is it's optimized for 3D printing without support material or with support material. So the hand itself, you'll find that the, uh, the joints are conical. Uh, you have joint pins that are stepped so that they won't bridge to the side of the joint. Uh, you'll also find that the wire guides going down the centers of the fingers are placed with holes to help eliminate overhangs. Uh, the fingers are held straight by dental rubber bands uh, so in the resting state, the hand is flat. And then there's a pump and solenoid set up controlling granular jamming. Uh, so the next step was a feasibility analysis. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we did analytical, computational, and physical analyses to see how well it was going to work. Uh, the major areas of interest were to determine that the rubber bands were, in fact, going to last. Because I'm sure when I said rubber bands, oh, uh, are you guys looking for rubber bands? No. no. Okay. No. <laughs> That's what it's like fresh off the printer. It's a fully articulated non-assembly model, which is a lot of fun to say. <laughs> All right. So uh, we want to determine that the rubber bands are robust enough that they're not going to fall apart. And we also want to determine that we can achieve a vacuum in a reasonable time frame. Because if you're trying to lift something and it takes a few minutes just to lift it up, it's not even worth using. Uh, and then the most important thing is to print the hand as a non-assembly model because it drastically re uh, reduces assembly and makes it far easier to deal with. Um, so when you look here, uh, making it a non-assembly model involved two major challenges. Uh, first, we needed to ensure that the printed joint pins were in fact strong enough and that they wouldn't break under the force of the motors. We also needed to prevent bridging in the absence of material. Uh, because again, because we're printing 
a pin inside a hole? Wow. <laughs> because we're printing a pin inside a hole, uh, we don't want it to stick to the side and fuse the finger. And the solution is a SOLIDWORKS analysis of joint pin stress under motor force, finding that the joint pins are, in fact, uh, not going to exceed the yield strength of the material. We also found, uh, through a test print in the fully articulated finger, that it can, in fact, move. This was really interesting because it was on a printer bot, a very low-end uh, hobby printer, and it still worked fine, which meant that it was a pretty robust design. For prototyping, the hand is controlled with an Arduino. There are two power circuits, one that's 6 volts, the Arduino and motors, and one at 12 volts, powering the vacuum and solenoid. The servo hubs are really interesting. They're made to fit by applying ABS cement to the inside of the servo hub. It's impossible to print teeth small enough to fit the servo. So instead, a hole slightly smaller than the servo hub is printed, and then it's t made tacky with ABS cement and pressed on. And that cuts teeth into the servo hub. Uh, here are early tests demonstrating finger motion and granular jamming. Currently, finger motion is controlled by a rotary potentiometer, so there's actually someone off screen moving the finger back and forth. Uh, ultimately, it will be controlled via a computer program, and ultimately, communication with the hand may be performed via Bluetooth. Uh, for a budget, uh, it ended up costing $363. It costs more to the order of $250 if you remove granular jamming, which it works fine without. Uh, all parts models, assembly instructions, and code are available online because, again, it's open source. Anybody should be able to do this. The hand requires no specialized tools, and most materials are readily available. Again, the arm is just eight pieces, and it's assembled with just 20 screws. Uh, the applications are, again, for static use by humanitarian aid groups. We're going to help people. We're going to fix lives, uh, make people have better quality of life. Uh, it's easily customizable and allows production at the source of the need. And it can also be used as a development platform. What I want to see is people run away with this and change it and, and make all sorts of different directions. Uh, I want to see it being used as an exoskeleton, as a hobby model, anything. Uh, and then some acknowledgments for the people involved. And that's it.